Good morning to everybody here in the auditorium, as well as to those that are joining us on Zoom. We are going to continue on our journey to the book of Hebrews. We left off the Hebrews 10 and 23. If you would, bow with me quickly as we pray and then continue our journey. Let us pray. Our most glorious and heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we come into you today, Heavenly Father, just fully recognizing that every first day of the week is your day, Heavenly Father, in which we dedicate to worship you according to your word. Please be with us as we take extra time, Heavenly Father, to dig into your word in our weekly Bible study, Heavenly Father. Help us to have full understanding so that we know how to apply these wonderful words to our lives so that we can do what we must do above anything else, and that's glorify you, your son, Jesus Christ. In whose name we do pray and ask it all. Amen. We left off at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. And as I always say, if we have any time left at the end, we will open it up for questions. I always say, please make your questions relevant to the lesson at hand. If it's a, a question outside of the scope of the lesson, please get with me or you can call me or text me or anything outside of class. So that we, we leave the time for the questions pertaining to this class. I'll, take the, I'll rotate from the classroom to the chat, depending upon the time. But without further ado, Hebrews 10 and 23, here the Holy Spirit lets us know that, let us hold fast the profession of our faith, and it says, without wavering. Notice it says, for he is faithful that promised. Now we could look at, we don't look at each part, we could look at that as a whole. Doesn't it, you ever heard people say, you have to consider the source? I remember when I was a young kid, somebody was messing with me. Back in those days, we said, you're picking at you, picking at you. And I remember a teacher said, don't, don't, don't listen, man. Consider the source. <laughs> and I don't understand what she meant at first. And she said, you know, he's getting bad grades. He, he's always getting in trouble. And you don't. He says, that's why he's picking at you. And it's amazing how that just it made perfect sense. Perfect sense. Now, why should we hold fast our profession? by our faith, because God is faithful. And why can I say that so boldly? Because the Holy Spirit said that. Let's look at this, for he is faithful. In 1 Corinthians 10 and the verses 13, y'all know this is my go-to scripture for any challenge or problem I face. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. What's that next part? But God is faithful. Wow. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. It should be easier for us as Christians to hold fast. And our profession is just standing bold on our confession. What do we confess? Jesus Christ is the son of God. Why is that so important? That's the foundation of everything that we believe in we do in the church. It's predicated upon that. You see, there's religions and cults that don't say Christ was a, there are some that don't say Christ was an angel. That's totally not true. But some will say, well, yeah, he's a great prophet. That's true. Some will say he's a great student. That's true. But very few will say he was the son of God. You see, that's a dividing line. That's part of our profession. And that we do, we're going to get deeper into this as we get further down, because it's all wrapped up in our belief. And the belief isn't just an intellectual understanding. We're going to talk about for Christians. But that Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Brother Sokol, we might make Hebrews 11 today. It says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching, what are we looking at? It says, and let us consider one another to provoke. Keep the, the pivotal uh, word in this uh, phrase is provoke unto love and to good works. As we said Wednesday night, provoke often is implied something negative. You know, stop provoking them, stop provoking them. Because usually you're trying to urge somebody to do something that they probably shouldn't do. Somebody's talking about you, your friend is saying, go ahead, pop them in his mouth. You'll stop talking then. That's provoking to the wrong thing. As Christians, it's amazing. You put Christ in it, it always flips it to the other side. Here, we as Christians are supposed to provoke one another into love. Unto love. I love uh, reading in the chat. 
I forget who it was, but somebody needed some help moving. And one particular brother went on the chat, says, I'll be there. I need somebody else to come with me. You see, that's provoking unto love. Because love for us, one of the aspects or byproducts of love for us is helping each other. And that can be in any and all things. I remember years ago when we first came down to Miami and the High the Church of Christ is no longer on this site, but where they used to be, uh, they used to have Christian homes for children. And I remember they were trying to set up a, a classroom upstairs and we got some young people to go out there and another congregation was brought their young people over too. And I saw one get out of the car. He got out of the car and slammed the door and was walking. And his mother was telling him, bye, bye. He wasn't saying a word. He kept right on walking. I said, whoa, young man, is that the, who's, who's dropping you off? That's my mom. I said, what's she saying? Bye. He turned around, bye. Still had that look. So I said, that's the wrong person to have up in there moving furniture. He's going to probably gonna drop something or hurt somebody. I said, listen, let's talk for a little bit. I was like, what is it? I was supposed to go to the movies this morning. And I said, really, what were you going to see? Transformers. He said, what time is the movie? Two o'clock. I said, well, it's eight, I mean, nine o'clock in the morning right now. I don't know what time we're going to be finished. So I said, we're, we should be done with all of you guys. We should be done by 12 if we're about our father's business. He was like, okay. Listen, I said, you give me a good day's work and I'll see if I can, I'll tell your mom, I'll take you over there and a couple of the other kids. Really? See, provoke to love because the slightest thing could have set him off. Somebody could say, go over and grab that chair. I'm going to grab that chair and you got an argument. We want to provoke, do all we can to care enough to provoke unto love. And we can all do that. We know what love feels like. Notice it says, unto love and to good works. That's often the end result. Verse number 25, which is often misinterpreted. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. I'm going to say what I said the other day. There were times when I was growing up where I would see people seriously sick have the flu or something, and they would have to miss, miss church for a few, church service for a few weeks. The, the day they would come back, they would come up front and say, they're asking forgiveness for forsaking the assembly. And even as a kid, I thought, well, you were sick. I mean, I, I, I witnessed one of my aunts bring you some soup. You were seriously sick. And as I, as I got older, I started studying. Forsaking the assembly does not simply mean missing a worship service. Unless you're missing it because I ain't going there to vote crazy elders today. It's a mindset. You're slipping away. If you're serious, like with the pandemic, if you're seriously sick, we urge you to stay home. We have an extra benefit now with Zoom, but even beyond that, if you're sick, you need to stay at home. That's not, that is not, folks, when you research this, that is not forsaking the assembly. We have to be careful because all that is doing is majoring in minor things. You're getting people having guilt that God didn't even put on them. So make sure we have a clear understanding, but we should, why? Notice how that comes, that verse comes right after the first verse, which says provoking unto love. Provoking unto love is finding, we found ways now. If you can't be here, God blessed us with Zoom. Provoking unto love. Now you don't have an excuse for missing. You can put it on Zoom and you can get it. And it's a thank God for Miami Garden, just a real worship service. It's not just a preacher up here tap dance and doing everything and make sure he gets paid. No, it's a full array of brothers leading. The way the Bible still is still meeting those biblical scriptures of what worship is. Not a one man show like you watch on some of these televangelists. That's not worship. That's somebody for doing a presentation. But may we thank God for what we have and we do it according to the good book. Hebrews 10, 26 and 27 says, for if we sin willfully, remember that, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. That's a heavy scripture. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Now you got to remember who the Holy Spirit is talking to here. He's not talking to the world. He's talking to the church. Let's look at these words. The first part there. For if we sin willfully. What does that mean? We're totally aware that it's wrong. 
We're totally aware that what we're doing is contrary to Christ. Watch how it continues. After that, we have received the knowledge. You got to look up that word received in the Greek. It means a full acceptance. So now watch this. You have fully received a revelation of God and you clearly understand what it means to be obedient, but you're still going to willfully sin. Now, Brother Nelson, you're saying, if I sin, it's all over. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying this is what should be on our mind. This is what makes it easier to sin less. Christ's blood still flows when we mess up, but are we doing it continually willfully? That's why I tell people, that I remember back in the day, there are people that say, that lady go up there every single week, confess the same sin. She ain't right. She ain't right. That's wrong. That's the wrong mentality. But on the flip side, is that person really dealing with that sin? That's what you got to be careful of. We all struggle with something. But the key thing is, are you really struggling with it? Or is it just, well, this is just how I, how I am. You know, I, I have to have sex every single day. I know I'm not married. I still got to have sex. It's just who I am. Oh, no, that, that's, that, that's not a part of Christianity. It's not, is it a struggle? It's supposed to be a struggle. You know what the Bible tells us? In our weakness, God's strength is made perfect. And you got to look at that. That weakness doesn't just mean, well, I have a sinful nature. No, it means when you're fighting so hard that you need help. God recognizes that. I challenge anybody to look at that lady that had the issue of blood 12 years. And I stress 12 years. That alone would have been hard enough, but then there's more to it. She spent all that she had on doctors trying to get rid of her. They all failed her. So on the human side, she could have easily just sat back and said, this is, this is not worth it. I'm just going to go ahead and do whatever I want to do. No, when Jesus came, she was. And when Jesus, she couldn't get to Jesus because of the crowd. But you know what she did? Did she give up? Even after all that, it would have been easy to say, well, I understand why she gave up. She made it through and just to touch the hem. Of, she had enough faith. She felt if I could just touch the hem of his garment. Not even talk to him, just to him of his garment. But because that faith was so great, Jesus blessed her. She was purified immediately. May we remember that when we have, no matter what our struggle is. You might be a kid worrying about passing the test. You might be a grown man that's tempted to cheat on his wife. Those are both struggles for that individual. But we all have the blood of Christ in common. We all have the scriptures in common. What are we doing with them? I think I told you all this story. I remember when me and my wife and I was blessed by our first house years ago down south. And, you know, I'm not a handyman, but I'm trying to get, trying to get better at it, this is the thing. And my wife had bought me a set of Sears tools. They look real nice. <laughs> I didn't use them a whole lot though. And then we had the cabinets and, you know, in the knobs of the cabinets, all of a sudden they come, they come a little loose. So I'm using one of her real nice butter knives to get that screw back in. And I was watching, I was like, why is she staring at me? This isn't that big. She said, Rick, you know, you got a nice set of tools in the garage. <laughs> why don't I use the right tool for the job? Such is the case in Christianity. We go through all these struggles. Are we using the tools that God equipped us with? Because the easiest thing we pull out of the drawer is complaining and I give up. Or oh, why me? God didn't give us any one of those tools. I was equipped to use a nice Phillips screwdriver. I chose to pull out a butter knife. And every time you use the butter knife, you bend it that much more. So why not use the tool that I was blessed to have? May we look at the toolbox we have in scripture. We, 1 Corinthians 13, you know, uh, growing up, uh, there was always a thing I would see in some of the seasoned folks' house that says, in case of fire, break glass. And it was always just a little caption up there. That's what 1 Corinthians 10 and 13 is for us. If you got an issue in life and it's like, man, what scripture can I use? I tell people, as a Christian, get a bevy of scriptures to use based on what you're going through so you can pull them out when you need to. I remember talking to a guy that used to work at, at Sunset and he was flirting with one of the girls on the job that worked in the front office. He was married. I was like, listen, buddy, you, you're a Christian, remember? He's like, yeah, it's just tempting. I said, you need to call out scripture. Well, I ain't got my Bible on. I said, you need to memorize them then. 
So what scripture can I use for that? Can I use for that? He didn't find the wife, found it the good thing. That's a starter. He's like, okay. I said, that's why we, those are our tools to make it through our problems. Now, as we get back to this, by us knowing that, it's like, and we're sinning willfully. What are we doing? Look at verse 27. It says, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment, if our indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. How do we fight through these sins? It's a conscious effort on our part, folks. It's best resolved. When you look at Romans 6 and 12, just look at this, this verbiage. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? That continue implies that you know what you're doing. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What is that saying? That's saying, well, the Bible says Christ's blood still flows. So if I sin, I'm covered anyway. That's not the intent of that scripture. You got to look at the intent and purpose. You see, there's a heart problem right there. If you sin willfully and you're totally aware of it and you keep, 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 keep doing it. Charles, remember how we take questions. Willfully over and over and we take, take, take questions. You have to, you have to be careful. You have to be very careful because you're putting yourself in a deadly situation because you know clearly what you're doing, according to Romans 6, 1 and 2. And you're saying, well, the grace is going by. No. Look at verse 2. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You see, when you're blessed to be a Christian, you've obeyed the five-step plan of salvation. According to scriptures, sin no longer reigns in your life. Do you still have the sinful nature? Yes. Will you fall in sin? Yes. But the mentality is, I don't, I'm, I'm putting up a fight. I don't want this to happen. Lord, I need your help. That's a true heart condition that the Lord works with. It's so important for us to remember that. Whew, now let's get to the verse 27. But a certain fearful looking for judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. What's a quick way to sum that up? I work with kids now almost every day. And one of the things I tell them every day, I said, if they come up saying they want to do something foolish, I said before, Miss Nelson, what should I do? I said, first of all, I want to thank you for seeking advice on something that could get you into serious trouble. And I said, I'm going to tell you something that will apply to every single circumstance that you're into that could get you in trouble. I said, consider the consequences. Consider the consequences. Now let's apply that to Christianity. Let's just say you want to continually sin. It's like, hey, I'm forgiven anyway. Well, let's look at what the end consequence really is. Second Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. And to you who are troubled, why are they troubled? Because it's, it's time for judgment now. Rest with us. Who are the us? Us are the Christians. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. This is the day we've all been living for. It says he's coming in flaming fire. To do what, folks? Let's let the scripture tell us. Taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. If you could continually sin willfully and you know what you're doing, you're putting yourself a guilty distance from God. Because the John 9 31 still tells us God does not hear a sinner's prayer. And when you sin, you're putting a guilty distance between you and God. I don't have time to go over all the scriptures about the heart condition. The heart condition, when you read about that, is pivotal to it. Because people will say, well, it says if I sin as a Christian, the blood will cleanse me. It's about the heart, though. Is your heart really in it or are you just trying to get over? You can't get up. Of all people to try to get over, you can't get over God. I tell people, never underestimate that word struggle. That word struggle helps you because it's showing you're putting, you're doing all that you can do to let Christ's blood do the rest. Don't just give up. It's not worth it when you look at eternal consequences. Hebrews 10, 28 and 29 lets us know he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall, shall he be thought worthy 
who had trodden underfoot the son, under the foot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and had done despite unto the Spirit of grace. What are we talking about here? First part, he says, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. Now, I'm sure no Christian in their right mind would ever say I've done that. You know, when we do that, I love how the scriptures say when we sin as Christians, we crucify Christ afresh. Think if you could actually physically see that, how he was beaten. You sin because he took all of our sins to the cross. Think of as a Christian, you're willfully sinning. Then you get, get to see this Christ going through that every single time. I think that would change some of our minds. But you have to understand spiritually, that's exactly what we're doing when we do that. That's why for his blood to still flow shows how much he really wants us to make it. Look at this verbiage. Trodden underfoot the son of God, Lord have mercy, hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. You realize the only thing that allows us to, to be priests, to go to take our sins directly to God is the blood of Christ. Without the blood of Christ, we are still in our sins. We have to consider those things when we're confronted with sin to do that. And the only thing, and have done despite unto the spirit of grace. You know what sums this up best? What do we have when we come to Christ? 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. I love how it says, behold, all things are become new. That's only through the blood of Jesus the Christ. Who are we to just treat that any old way? You feel so good when we're baptized and you like, whoa, you're saved now. Well, how are you saved? Because you came in contact with the blood. Ooh, but man, I might sin again, but his blood still flows. Look how good God makes it. That should want to encourage us to sin a whole lot less, if at all. And we know we still have the sinful nature, once again, where is the real struggle? The brother, she was just fine. I couldn't turn that down. What if Christ would have said, your sins are just too heavy. I can't save you. What would we be in that situation? But he did. And I'm going to bring back the lesson when we walk the road to Calvary and see literally what he went through. It's not this little, you know, carrying a, a, a cross and they put him on the cross. It was much worse than that when you follow. It was designed to be a torture. All the way up. The average man couldn't make it the whole way. May we consider that when we consider our sinful condition and woe is me, why am I down? Think of Christ would have done that. Even the son of God leaned on his father's will, not even his own. Because he was in the form of man. He knew enough to lean on the will of the father, which is best for him. Can we lean on the will of Christ? in our sinful condition, it's the best we can do. Hebrews 10, 30 and 31. For we know him that has said, vengeance belongeth to me. I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall on the hands of the living God. That's a powerful scripture. Who said vengeance belongeth to me? That's the Lord on behalf of his people. I think I mentioned this before. Do you know how good it feels to have somebody real powerful that, got, that has your back? That's a powerful, powerful thing. I had the blessing when Gail and I worked in juvenile justice. I forget the judge's name. He was real close friends with a real influential judge in juvenile justice called Judge Peterson. And he saw the good work we were doing with these young men. And he looked at me and I was like, what is he going to ask me? Because he was looking hard. He said, you have any children? I said, yeah, I have, I, have, I have two young boys. He was like, if they ever get in trouble, he said, you let me know. And my whole point was not to, well, if Ricky robs a store, I can't say, no, I'll set him free. I mean, he's got to pay the consequence. But at least I knew he would be in the hands of a fair judge. He said, let me know. Because he appreciated the work that was being done. You see, as Christians... The Bible says we're supposed to abound in good works. Salvation is supposed to be a gimme once we accept Christ. The good works are supposed to follow. And most of you know, as you will hear, Revelation, blessed are those who die in the Lord. That's what that last part says. 
for their works do follow them. It counts. You got to ask yourself. He's not talking about just elders and deacons and ministers. He's talking about Christians. Ask, go, go home and look in the mirror today and say, what's my work? What work am I doing? I'm coming to church. Oh, that's your reasonable service. I'm coming to Bible study. That's your reasonable service. What's your work? And be careful. I hear people say sometimes, they'll say, well, I don't feel called to that. That whole phrase came from the denominational world. People said, well, he's a powerful preacher because he was called to preach. Where is that in the Bible? Well, he was called. No, 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 no. We're only called by the gospel. And that's everybody. And we're called by the gospel to salvation. After that, you make a choice on where you serve. Look at our brother Charles. Does a wonderful job at uh, leading songs. Charles wasn't called to lead songs. Charles was called to be a Christian. And then, and then you know what Charles said? I'm going to lead songs. So I'm going to get with Brother Jesse. And I'm going to start practicing so I can become a little more perfect. That's the same for everybody. But so, now it has to be a lady can't say what well, I want to preach because that's not authorized in the Bible. But you're called to do a work for the church because you choose to do it for the Lord. I didn't dream of being a preacher or an elder growing up. That's something that came along later in life. And I said, I'm going to choose. So I'm going to start studying hard. I'm going to start talking to elders. And now, thank God, I'm blessed to be a preacher and an elder. I wasn't called to do that. I was called to be a Christian. Once you choose, then God will help equip you. Please be clear on that. There's no specific where you're called to be a preacher, like God just put written, wrote it in heaven. No, that's denominational talk. Mm -mm. You choose where you're going to serve. God will equip you with your faithfulness and obedience. Let us continue. Notice where it says, and I, I put a box around it, the Lord shall judge his people. I think we spoke about this last week too, but I'll hit it again. The Lord shall judge his people. Be careful when you say judgment. It's not the same judgment for Christians and non-Christians. Because first of all, when you stand before a judgment, you know, you already know where you're going. Because if you die before Christ returns, everybody, Christian or non-Christian, is going to Hades. People say, well, that means hell. See, that word hell has been polluted. Everybody thinks all hell is bad. Hell in the original Hebrew and Greek can mean either the grave, could mean the Hadean world, which had a place of comfort or a place of torment, and it means the lake of fire. The only one that's ultimately bad is the lake of fire and the place of torment. When you die, your soul, if it's saved, will go to the place of comfort. If it's unsaved, will go to the place of torment. If you're in the place of torment, you know where you are. It's a place of, the, the actual definition is a place of conscious souls. And you know what? When you read Luke 16, there's a great gulf of faith. You can see between them. Those that are unsaved can see who's saved. Those that are saved can see who's unsaved. Talk about a living hell, literally. But, and you know, that's the holding place. You know, you've heard of people in the penitentiary. Before they get to the penitentiary, they're in a jail, a holding cell. Then they go before the judge and find out what the, what the verdict is. And if they're found guilty, then they go to the penitentiary. The big, the big house, they call it. When you're in the Hadean world, you know whether you're going to the lake of fire or heaven. Talk about that. Now, it says the Lord shall judge his people. Those that are in the place of torment will go stand before God with the consequence of going to the lake of fire. Revelation says there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Bible also says, by, that, by thy words thou shalt be justified and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Other words, the, the words you spoke were going to be held against you or will help save you. There's a reason why we say, I confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That leads to life eternal. The opposite, well, man, I ain't got time for that. You know, I'm rich. I got, I, I got everything I need. Imagine hearing that on the day of judgment in front of Christ. And there are people out there that I told you about Ronald Reagan Jr., Says, I'm not an atheist. That's not, I'm an atheist that's not afraid to burn in hell. Direct quote. I would rather reign in hell than be a servant in heaven. Direct quote. Obviously, the man has no idea. What gets me is people that haven't even, at least if you're going to comment on it, study it and see. He just doesn't like the whole idea of leaning on a God. 
him and Bill Maher both say, it seems like it's a religion for those who just want to crutch. Well, who said you're perfect in and of yourself? Just because you got a little influence and money, which according to 1 Peter was all going to burn up one day anyway. That's the reason why the Bible says every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. Some to eternal life, some to eternal condemnation. That's enough to at least make me take a second look at least. See, let me make sure what I'm not accepting is there's no consequence. And like I tell people, living a strong Christian life is a good positive thing anyway, even if you're still learning. It's a great, what do you, in other words, what do you have to lose? Because if you don't accept it, you have everything to lose. There's no second chance when it comes to judgment. The second chance is now. But we have to see that. But speaking about judgment, those that are judged that are unsaved, eternal condemnation. Those that are saved, well, why, why am I being judged if I'm saved? You're being judged for you, the works that you did. Well, well, I know the man will still be saved, but you won't get as many rewards. I don't know about you all, but when it comes to God and rewards, I want everything I can get because it's promised to me. Let's look at scripture. First of all, look at 1 Peter 4 and 18 to see how much room we got to play with. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, we could stop right there. Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? So even being saved, we just make it in. You know what that just make it, it is? It's the blood of Christ. But you have to come in contact with that. Don't fall prey to that belief only. If it's just belief, you never come in contact with the blood. I say that a lot because that's such a, to me, an easy thing to comprehend. Are you saved? Yes, I'm saved. What are you saved from? Uh, you saved from your sins? Yes. What saved you from your sins? The blood of Christ. When did you come in contact with the blood of Christ? When I asked Christ into my heart. That's nowhere in the Bible, Old or New Testament. The Bible makes it clear you come in contact with the blood of Christ through the watery grave of baptism. That's the only way. And if you haven't done that, it's not for me to say you're not saved. It's for me to tell you what the Bible says saves you. Well, all religions are the same. No, they're not. That's an easy thing. Well, just because if we have a love for God, that's not in the Bible either. So you believe in the Bible, right? But why aren't you believing what the Bible says? Let's take time and walk through. I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I'm just trying to show you what the Bible says based upon what you're saying. Now, we see we don't have a lot of room to play with. Now, what happens when the righteous are, are judged? 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 16. Every man's work, because every man is in the context is the mankind in the church. Every man's work shall be made manifest. But for the day shall declare it, judgment day, because it shall be revealed by, what is that? Fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. You know what's the metaphor here? When you read the upper scriptures, they're talking about precious gold. You know what makes gold pure? They run it through intense heat, almost like firing clay when you make clay. A uh, 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 earthen clay vessel. When it comes out of the fire, it's hard and it doesn't pop or anything. They run uh, gold through that. Guess what that fire does? It takes away all the impurities. And that's where you get into the care. It's 24, 18 care. It's, it's lost all of its impurities and it's pure gold. This is how God is going to do our works. And it says, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Uh-oh, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, praise God. So what reward do you want to lose? I don't think we want to lose any. Heaven is a beautiful place, according to Scripture, and I believe that. But God is saying you can have that and some rewards all for just working for me. And here's the bonus part. And we spoke about, I speak about this all the time. It's just so powerful. Working for God means your servant. You know what the word for servant is? You should all know it by now, doulos. 
Now look at how God made this great for all of us. All do those simply means is you're so concerned and wrapped up in reaching the goals of your master. And in so doing, he will more than take care of you. I don't know about you all, but I was sound on the dotted line quick. What do you have to lose? It's literally set up for us to make it and make it with rewards. Now, the, the, norm, the next question I normally get when I teach this is, well, what kind of rewards are we talking about? The Bible doesn't specifically say, you know, it mentions a mansion. Now, I don't believe it's talking about like, a, like the equator mansion down here. It's a wonderful place to live. But now, what are rewards? Rewards. We don't like, well, I get a nice car up there. No, it's not an earthly thing. What we have to realize is the scripture does tell us this, and you all know this one. I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither has even entered into the heart of mankind. Those things, rewards, that God has in store for those who love him. Want the street version of that? No matter how wonderful you think God's rewards are, you haven't even scratched the surface. Our mind can't even, our mind can only go 3D. This is like 18D. Our minds can't go there because it's on a spiritual plane, but it's going to be more than what we ever anticipated. I don't know about you all, but that would make me want to work doubly hard. And that's a blessing for Christians, all Christians to go at. You know what's beautiful? God expects us all to help each other. One of the many things I'm so happy about in this wonderful con congregation is that young adult ministry. They're better known as the yams. They look after each other. I poked in sometime. They didn't know listening to their group meetings and everything. And I am so impressed how they're looking after each other. That's just the best I've ever seen. Congratulations, guys. You are setting a model of what needs to be done. They're their brother and sister's keeper in that group. Not saying that the whole congregation isn't. I'm just saying I've witnessed it so great to see that with young people. Because there's so many other distractions. Once you get old, there's only so much you want to do anyway. I'm not tempted to go to the club, Sister Val. <laughs> I'm not tempted to drink or I, I, that doesn't tempt me anymore. But being young, it kind of pops up every now, just especially being in the Marine Corps. So, but they, they put all that to the side to do things of the Lord and look after each other. That's a beautiful thing. I tell all young people that are not even there baptized, I say, come to Miami Garden, you'll be taken care of. Some young people got it going. Hebrews 10, 32, 33, as we hasten to a close here. Verse 32, but call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock, what is this? Both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. What are we talking about here? Let's look at this first part. First of all, it says the call to remembrance, the former days in which after you were illuminated. What is this talking about? This is talking about when you came into Christ and you became aware of the knowledge of Christ. That's the term, you know, many times light in the Bible means knowing the knowledge of God. This illuminated is you're fully aware of what you're supposed to do. This, this is a perfect setup too. I tell people when Miguel and I was growing up, if uh, we were told to do something by our mother and we didn't do it or we got caught up doing something and then she pulled up, it's like, uh-oh, you know, when we got a whooping, you know what was stated before the whooping? Kind of, kind of at the same time, Sister Valerie, didn't I tell, the reason why I'm moving is that's us running. <laughs> didn't I tell you? She made it clear that you understood this. You still chose to do something else and now you got caught. But there's a consequence, mama. After you were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of affliction. See, this is the way it's supposed to be. You, you were made aware to do better, and now you're facing the challenges of the world. There's supposed to be a fight. I told you, don't let that fight and struggle scare you. That's what's supposed to happen. What's bad is if you don't put up a fight. And how do we put up this fight? Romans 12 and 1 lets us know. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. In other words, I'm begging you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or expected service. you a young person not married, not having sex is going to be a struggle for a while. But are you putting up a fight? 
That's your reasonable service because of what Christ did for you. I like to put it in this simple way. Christ died for us so that we could live for him. And thinking about how he died for us should give us more strength to live for him. Wasn't it worth it? Verse 33, it says, partly whilst you were made a gazing stock. That gazing stock, have you ever, <laughs> I love seeing this. The best example I can think of is when you see little kids. Let's say if they're over in a room doing something and you happen to come by and you peep in and they look up and they see you and they go look like this. Without even being there, you know they were doing something they weren't supposed to be doing. And now they're wondering, did you see me? You see that all on their face. Many times in Christianity, when we're doing things that we know that we're not supposed to do, the guilt sets in. The Bible says in, 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 in 1 Peter that baptism is an answer of a good conscience towards God. That's why we're all born with a natural conscience and then with the Holy Spirit, it really tings when you know oh, I shouldn't be doing this. And you can feel the scriptures, old English calls it gazing stop. You feel like the spotlight's on you. People that don't maintain in Christ, that's why they fall away from the church. They've done so many things, they come back and they, the guilt sets in a second. No, uh, and then you miss one Sunday, then two Sunday, then you forsaken the assembly at that point. It's a, the, the word falling away, it's like a slope. I don't know if you've ever tried to climb up a, a mountain with snow on it like I have. It's like every time you take a step, you're going to slide like two more. You're going to take another one and you, you just got to maintain, you got to have on shoes that have good footing that you can go all the way up. If not, every step is just making you slide further back. That's what falling away is when Hebrews 10 and 25. May we stay strong with that. Woo. It says gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions. You feel bad and you're feeling afflicted. But if we could look at that just as that's the natural struggle that we're supposed to go through, especially if we're in a state of sin, that's going to feel real bad. Why do you think our brother Job, we're going to close out here. Why do you think our brother Job fought so hard, even in his own household, his friends came by and were saying, oh, you must have done something wrong for all this to happen to you. He had to fight them off. Then his, even his own wife said, why don't you curse God and die? Can you imagine that? That he still didn't talk bad back to He said, you're speaking as a foolish woman. He maintained his integrity through all of that pain because he stayed in the struggle he fought because he knew as we get further down, Lord's will next week, you'll see why it's worth it. Most of us know it because we want to go to heaven, but it gives us some details on why it's worth it. So we're going to close out now. I hope this lesson was enough to make you at least make it through this week till we get back into it next week. And as is always, well, the men are going to meet in the fellowship hall. We're going to maintain CDC guidelines. Make sure you have your mask on up above your nose, and we will see you all back here at 10 a.m.